place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. Well, here we are. It's Monday night. Aren't you glad? You used Tide. Don't you wish everybody did? Um, we are in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 9. That's where we left off last week, Christ above Moses. The previous chapter, Christ was made like unto his brethren, illustrating the fact that Jesus died for people, not for angels, not for elephants and giraffes and dogs and cats. He died for people. And then in the first chapter, of course, of Hebrews, he spent all that time illustrating and proving that Jesus Christ is God, the creator of all. And that's a hard concept for some people. They're always trying to separate. But Jesus said, I and the Father are one. There's no separation, actually. It's just while he was on earth, he took a body and clothed divinity because God in his natural state, as I told you last week and the week before, cannot what? He can't die. If more of you would like to participate, that'd be all right, because the more you participate, the more we might decide to give you money. <laughs> might, that's a key operative word there, might. So let's start in verse 9 where we left off last week. When our fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now the object here is to get into the promised land. And the children of Israel rebelled against God. Now the wilderness experience, you need to understand, is a experience of babyhood. It's immaturity. Everybody that ever becomes a Christian has a legitimate wilderness experience. But then there's a point where God says it's time to graduate and grow up. In the wilderness, God works for you. He just does things for you. In the promised land, there's wars and there's hills and there's planning to be done and reaping to be done. But God works through you instead of for you. That's the difference. Well, the children of Israel didn't want to go into the promised land. And so when the 10 spies, the 12 spies came back, two of the spies said, we can do this. God said so. The other 10 said no. And they disheartened the, tri the whole tribe of Israel, the whole people of Israel. And God said, okay, you're not going to go in, but your children will go in later. And in 40 years later, the children went in and 604,000 men had to die in the wilderness. And their bodies, you can just imagine. I, I, I think the people probably got tired of burying them, you know. They just threw one of them on the wayside, and they're walking around. It's an 18-day march from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea. Took them 40 years going around in circles. God led them in circles. And I'm sure some little kid said, hey, Mom, 
What's the, what's, what do you want? So, look, I think that's Uncle Bill over there dead. There was dead bodies everywhere. And they just kept marching in circles and marching in circles for 40 years because they would not trust God. And out of that whole 604,000 men, the only two that got into the promised land was Joshua and Caleb because they had wholly followed the Lord and they believed they could trust God and go in there and conquer that land. So we pick it up here. After they tempted and proved God, they kept pushing God and pushing God and pushing God. And if you go back and read all the stories, I mean, the children of Israel would be real spiritual one day and they say, oh, God's our guy. You know, he's our God and everything was cool. And then the next time you turn around, a few days later, they're worshiping idols. And God had to destroy a bunch of them. And there's many times God killed thousands of these people because they would not. One particular time, he sent 2,000 of them directly into hell through the earth. He just opened up the earth and swallowed them all up because they rebelled against him. This is very important that you understand this principle because you can't work to get your salvation. You can only trust Jesus. Wherefore, and I told you before, but I'll tell you again, whenever you see the word wherefore or therefore in the Bible, ask yourself this question, wherefore, the therefore, or what's the therefore, therefore, or the wherefore? Because it always connects a statement that was previously made to the one that's coming up. The fathers tempted God, and because of that, God was grieved with that generation. They do always err where? Where do they err? In their hearts. In their hearts. Some of the rest of you aren't following along or you're just too shy. I don't think you're too shy. Don't be afraid to talk when I ask you to. Just don't talk when I don't ask you to. They erred in their hearts. That's a very demanding and understanding principle here. A thief is not a thief when he steals something. A thief is already a thief in his heart before he steals. If he didn't have it in his heart, he wouldn't do it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A murderer is a murderer in his heart before he ever pulls the trigger. It's that with all sin. All sin originates in the heart. So God says they erred where? In their hearts. And they have not known my ways. Actually, they didn't want to know his ways. Sounds like a lot of people in America today. They don't want to know about the Lord. The only reason I get an audience here is because we're housing and feeding you. Folks, we're not housing you and feeding you to be nice. We house you and feed you so you have to come to Bible study. You don't have a big choice. You can either come to Bible study or you can go somewhere else. It's really pretty simple. But everything in life has a price tag, doesn't it? And this is the price tag. But we're doing that because we care about your soul. We care as what happens to you after you die. As far as what happens to you while you're here on earth, it's not really all that important. But I've learned that if you've got to go fishing, Martin's a good expert on this, if you're going to go fishing, you've got to use the right kind of bait. Well, we're fishing. The Bible calls us fishers of men. The shelter, the food, the utilities, everything that we offer you is the bait on the hook. And we're hoping as we keep casting our line out there that we're going to catch some fish. People. And every once in a while we catch one. I've got two in Livingston now that are both, one guy just started preaching and he's been preaching in churches. Last weekend he preached in a little Baptist church and uh, he's still living at God Tell. And uh, I'm just so tickled over Billy. His name's Billy Ringo. He sounds like a gunslinger. <laughs> Billy Ringo. <laughs> and, of course, Jonathan Moore. You know, Jonathan Moore just preaches to everybody he comes in contact with. He about drives some folks nuts, but that's okay. They need to be driven nuts because he's doing his job as a Christian. And uh, he's very honest, and a lot of people are mad at him because they don't like what he's saying. But what he's saying is absolutely the truth. And I think he's learned a little bit of that from me. I said, you know, you've got to risk friendships. If you tell the truth and they don't like it, so be it. The truth can set you free. A lie will put you in bondage. 
And uh, he's had an occasion to go to somebody in their church who's trying to leave his wife for another woman and just look him in the face and say, it's wrong, it's sin. It is. The guy has no reason, you know. I had a lady come to me one time. She says, Brother June, can you pray for me? I said, well, sure, I'd be glad to. What, what, what seems to be the problem? She says, well, I want you to pray that God would show me when it was time to leave my husband. I said, what? She repeated herself. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, let, let's stop here. For, I said, let, let, me, let me know a little bit about your husband. Is he, a, is he uh, committing adultery or something? Oh, no, no, he's faithful. Well, does he treat the children bad? Oh, no, he's a good daddy. I said, well, he doesn't work, he's lazy and won't support you. Oh, no, he's got a good job and we, we do well, you know. I... I said, I thought she was crazy wanting to leave this guy after telling me all this stuff. This guy was like the perfect husband, you know. And I said, well, why do you want to leave him? She said, he's boring. I said, ma'am, show me that in the Bible where you can leave your husband because he's boring. This woman's nuts. She wanted a little bit of excitement, and that's going to get her in trouble. She had it made. But he was boring. Well, my wife can never say that about me. There's never a moment's peace in our house, and there's just the two of us there. I'm not going to let her be bored with me. But, folks, God's ways and man's ways are two different ways. And you've got to make a choice to trust God and believe what he says, whether you like it or not. Now, I want to let you in on something early here. There's a lot of things in the Bible I don't like. I don't like Romans chapter 13, where God tells us to obey the laws of the land. I don't like traffic laws. <laughs> if I was running things, we'd all drive as fast as we wanted to, and it'd be survival of the fittest out there. <laughs> Them old people that have to get off the highway. Brother Jim's a coming. But I try to drive the speed limit because God said to obey the speed, the, the laws of the land. That's one of the laws of the land. I don't like the scripture that tells me I can't overeat. I fight that. Oh, I've been fighting that for years, that battle. God says not to be a glutton. And boy, I love to eat. Put food in front of me and I can show you a disappearing act. <laughs> I can make it disappear. Unless it's black-eyed peas. <laughs> Just about anything else, though. I can eat it. Any wild animal, I don't care. I eat it, you know. I used to love to go squirrel hunting. I don't have time anymore. Martin and I used to go squirrel hunting. And we'd come on and bring those squirrels, and we'd clean them up. And the old women would get them things and cook them up, and we would eat them up. Right, beggar? Oh, man, that was good stuff. Now I don't get to do that much, so I'm always looking at, when I come over to Martin's house on Mondays, I'm trying to scout out and see if Martin has shot some quail or if Martin has been fishing so I can eat his fish. Yeah. <laughs> I love to eat, folks, but I've had to limit myself, and I don't like it, you know. I didn't even eat any dinner last night except a pickle. I had a pickle. I had a pickle because they, pickles help you not have leg cramps, so I eat pickles a lot. There's a lot of things in there I don't understand. There's a lot of things I don't like. But I have made a choice in my life to believe what God says. And I will do what God says. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter to my rest. Now take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. It's things don't get you in hell. Sin doesn't get you in hell. Unbelief gets you in hell because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin already. Paid the penalty for all your sin, even those you haven't committed yet because actually you weren't here when he died and paid the penalty for your sin anyway. But it's unbelief, not trusting Jesus in departing from the living God. So exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest, listen carefully, Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Folks, you need to understand sin is deceitful. Sin will lie to you. Sin will make it sound like it's okay. You're not so bad. You're as good as 
the rest of the folks. Well, you might even be better, but who wants to be the top rat on a sinking ship? What difference does it make? Sin will lie to you. It says things like, committing adultery is okay if you're in love. I've had people tell me that. And I say, well, that's really interesting. Would you show me in the Bible where it says that you can commit adultery if you're in love? Well, it doesn't say that anywhere. It says, thou shalt what? Not. Not. But you see, a lot of people want to believe what people say rather than what God says because people don't really like what God says a lot. I don't always agree with what God says, but I choose to do it because it's right. If it was up to me, there are some people in the world, I'd just knock them in the head with a stick. <laughs> but God won't let me do that. It's wrong. It's sin. And if you're going to sin, folks, let me tell you something. At least be honest with God and yourself. Call it what it is. Because if you're honest with God, God and you can work together. And eventually you might actually get victory over that thing. And you may not get it until you leave planet Earth. But you'll be a long way down the road towards it. For we are partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now, I told you last week the word if can also be translated because of or since. Now, it makes, and some people use this verse to say you can lose your salvation. But I, and I don't have time to get into an in-depth study on that, but I will share a couple of verses. But Jesus said, first of all, no man can pluck you out of my father's hand. Je Jesus talked through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 and said, What can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? And the answer was nothing. You're not going to lose your salvation. Rome, uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will, will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus, until Jesus comes back. He's in the process of time conforming you to the image of Christ. And each day the inner man is being renewed just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, while the outward man is decaying, getting old and ugly. I hate it when I ask people, there are people trying to pull my leg. I walk in the bank, a little girl says, well, Mr. Gentry, how are you doing today? I said, how do I look? She's 22 or three, and she says, oh, you look great. I said, you're a liar. I got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel and you tell me I look great? <laughs> the other day I walked to the bank and the lady said, how you doing? I said, how do I look? She said, okay. I said, thank you for being honest. I can live with okay. <laughs> but don't tell me I'm looking good. I said, whoa, you know. You must be weird or something. I told this one girl, when she said that. I said, you're like, what, 23 years old? I said, I'm 71. She says, age doesn't matter. I decided I better get out of that bank pretty quick. <laughs> she might have been after my money. I don't know. <laughs> well, you don't think I'm stupid, do you? <laughs> so while it is said today, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. The provocation was when they were wandering around in the wilderness, provoking God by not believing. They would not believe. Now, this believing thing is very, very important, and you need to understand it's a choice. Now, I've told you all for years, people that have been here, smiling is a choice. You can choose to smile even if your left leg's falling off. And I've watched people in deathbed situations where they died, Christians dying with a smile on their face because they knew where they were going. And I've watched lost people die, and they hang on to every second of life they can and curse and curse God and everything else you can imagine. So they provoked God, and God says, don't do that. You need to listen. You need to really hear, not with your ear, but with your heart. You need to process what goes in and let it settle in your heart. That's a choice. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Not everybody that came out of Egypt, some of them didn't, but a lot of them did. They provoked God. 
<clears throat> but with whom was he grieved for forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? All the men died. There's 604,000, if you go back to the book of Numbers and total up all the soldiers from age 20 on up to, I think it was 60 or 55 or 60, and those soldiers in there had to die. And so God just let them wander around in the wilderness till they all died. And people say, oh, well, if he's a loving God, he wouldn't do that. No, the fact that he's a loving God is proved, is proved by the fact that he warned us. It's our fault. Those people that died in the wilderness, it was their own fault. If you sit here tonight and reject Christ and one day end up in hell, you're going to have nobody to blame but yourself. Because don't come up with that, well, a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. He doesn't. You send yourself there. If that's what you want, just keep saying no to Jesus. And ergo and anon, yonder you'll get there. I just wanted to throw those words in because I like to use them once in a while. Folks, it's, it's, it's pathetic that the majority of the people that have ever lived and that are alive today are going to go to hell. Most of the religions, well, other than Christianity, they're all going to hell. And those are religious people. That's really sad to be religious all your life and then die and go to hell too. I guarantee you, the people that put dynamite on their bodies and blow themselves up to kill people, they're not going to heaven. I can promise you that. The Mormons are never going to become gods like they thought. And the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe hell exists, but they're going to end up there anyway. The Christian scientists who say, we're not here, we're not here, we're not here, they're going to end up there too. Along with the Buddhists and the Hindus and all the people that have rejected Christ for some other god. They're going to end up in hell. I don't want them to go to hell. Folks, I don't even want the devil to go to hell. But he's going. God promised us that. But I never want him to go to hell. You know, the devil's kind of a neat guy, really, because he's not immoral like people think. He's probably the most moral creature in the universe. He just wants to be God. And he can't be. You know why? We already got one. And we're only going to get one. That's it. But that's his big, his big sin, his pride. He thought he was good enough to replace God. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 14. Five times, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, but he won't. People are going to die and go to hell. Jesus said that the way that leads to destruction is broad, and many will find it. The way that leads to life, Jesus said, is very narrow. And few will find that. I mean, you got to search. Diligently seek God unless you just don't want to. Getting saved is easy. Getting past that hump in the road where you finally make the choice, that's hard. And most people never will get over that little hump because they're too busy messing their lives up and enjoying it. You do know that there is some fun in sin, don't you? For the flesh? Well, of course there is. There's a lot of things that are fun that I don't do anymore because, you see, I learned that there's always a price tag somewhere down the road, and I don't want to pay. Some of you have paid. You've been in jail. You've been other places, and you've paid. You've been in relationships that fell apart. You paid, and if you're not careful, you're going to be paying some more. If you don't do things God's way, you're going to be paying and sadly to say, but it's true, if I find out that you did something stupid after hearing this message and you end up paying, I'm going to look at you and say, I told you so. I've had people say, you wouldn't do that, would you, Brother June? I sure would. And you know what's worse? On Judgment Day, God's going to look at you and say, I told you so. But you wouldn't listen. And then you say, well, when did you tell me? And then he's going to play back all the preachers you've heard in your life. All the times you looked at the Bible. All the times that somebody tried to help you find Christ. He'll play it all back for you. And you'll have no excuse. There are none. So, they provoked God, but 
with whom was he grieved forty years, those had sinned, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they would not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So you see, they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. I was preaching, I was doing a Sunday school, actually, I was the whole Sunday school department at Mount Zion ISCME Church in North Redlands, north of Nacogdoches, which is about 16 miles. First three years of my ministry, I preached only in black churches. I couldn't get in a gringo church to save my life. They, they you know, took one look at me and said, what are you, Mexican? I said, yeah, oh, Mexican, okay, we don't want you. So, but all the black churches would invite me to preach. I preached in a lot of black churches. And uh, I was in this church and there was an old man in there. And I, back in those days, I was a lot more bold than I am now. I just, I just, I just tell people the truth. That's, that's what Jonathan Moore reminds me of me back 45 years ago, something like that. And I looked at this man, and he's in his 80s. And I said, sir, you're about to die. You got that proverbial banana peel going there, and you got one foot in the grave. I said, what are you doing to make sure you meet Jesus? And he looked at me, and he says, I'm working the works of God. I said, you are. He said, yes, sir. I said, what are they? Boy, he got a horrible look on his face and his mouth dropped. And he said to me, he said, Brother June, I've been going to that church all my life. And they kept telling us we have to do the works of God, but nobody ever told us what they were. I said, then how are you going to do them if you don't know what they are? It perked his interest. Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. In verse 28, Jesus was asked this question by his disciples. Lord, what must we do to work the works of God? Well, that's the question, isn't it? It's right there in the Bible. And Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe on him that God has sent. It's a choice. You can believe if I can believe, you can believe. If Nancy can believe, you can believe. Marty and Mary, they made a choice to believe. You can make a choice to believe. Everybody in here that's a Christian has made a choice to believe. We didn't say we understood it. We don't. But we do believe it. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what? Believe. Believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. Believing is a choice. Folks, you got to make the choice. Now, I will tell you that if you make that choice from the heart, God is going to change your life. And on the other side of getting saved, you may not want God to change your life like that, but I'm going to tell you from getting to the other side of being saved that God never does anything in your life that not, you're not better off with in the first place. Everything he takes out of your life, you didn't need. Everything he puts in your life, you're better off with it. And boy, I tell you what, there's some tough decisions that come with that choice to believe. I remember when I got saved, I'd been through a divorce. My first wife ran off with my best friend. And uh, I was pretty tore up. And I was messed up. Then I ended up in, in jail. I was going to be there a long, long time. Got out of jail, came to Texas. I was a brand new Christian. I got saved while I was in jail in November of 1971. And I came to Texas, and I'd been in and out of a couple relationships that eh, they didn't work. And I finally pretty much just decided to stay single. I don't like being single, actually. But I decided that if that's what God wanted, that's what I'd do. I had a little boy. He was four years old. He was actually three when we left California, and I was raising him. He's 50 now. I'm not sure how he made it to 50, but he did. And uh, I was sitting on the grass at Stephen F. Austin State University eating peanuts. I said, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Well, it got that way. I was throwing the shells over into the grass eating peanuts, and Nancy walked by. Now, you got to know this is 45 years, 44 years ago. She was younger. No wrinkles. 
cute, cute, cute. That helped. But the important thing was, while I was sitting there, she walked by and said, did you know those are biodegradable? Hey, folks, I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> she has a degree in biology. She knows stuff. And I looked up at her from where I was sitting, and there was this woman in her hot pants. <laughs> she had some shorts on. And I looked up, and God spoke to me. I'd already been a Christian for about two years. And God said, that's the woman you're going to marry. Okay. So I got up and I followed her home. Today that would be stalking and I'd be in prison. I followed her home. And then I, on the door, and she came to the door and I said, hello, will you marry me? And she, she laughed so hard I thought she was going to fall down right in the doorway. She thought that was a funny, I didn't even tell her my name. Just asked her if she wanted to marry me. Well, we talked about the Lord after that found out she wasn't a Christian. And I said, God, I can't marry that woman. I know what your book says about being unequally yoked. I cannot marry a non-Christian. And all God would say was, that's the woman you're going to marry. So I left that Monday after she got worn out listening to me. And I came back the next day. And I talked to her about Jesus again. And I did that until she was worn out again. Then I went home. And then I came back on Wednesday. And I talked to her about the Lord. And Wednesday afternoon, about 3.15 and 37 seconds, I don't, <laughs> it was about 3 o'clock, she asked Jesus to be her Lord and Savior. She got saved. I've been living with her all these years. She got saved. Best as I can know about any other person in the world. And we got married the next week. We only knew, knew each other. It was either 8 or 12 days. I can't remember now. But it wasn't very long. It was a whirlwind courtship. Actually, we never even dated, except we went to church together a couple times, and then we got married. And God said, that's the woman you're going to marry. And I had to trust that God knew what he was talking about. Looking back over 44 years, God knew what he was doing. He knew this ministry would be here. He knew we would need her to run this thing. I can't do it. I mean, the office work and the paperwork, I can, I can fix tractors and cars and I can dig holes in the ground and I can, I can pretty much, you know, pay the bills and stuff, but she has to balance the checkbooks and take care of the IRS stuff and the accounting with the Axley and Rody and all that stuff. It's a ton of work that has to be done that I could have never done. So what God did was hooked me up with a woman that would work six days a week and not even get a paycheck. And that puts a smile on my face. God knew what he was doing, folks. My job was to trust him. When we started God Tell, God said, we were not going to have any fundraisers. We don't take government money. We have to trust him. I have to trust him every day. We have to trust God. And if God doesn't want this place here anymore, then there will be a clothes sign on the door. Because we don't have any means of support, actually. God puts it on people's hearts. And some months it's not even the same people, you know, just new people just show up, you know, and, or don't show up but send us a check to House and Feed because they want to help you. And we have to trust the Lord. But for 40 years that we've been in operation, every December the 31st, all of God tells bills are paid and we don't owe anybody anything. The new buildings that we're building in Nacogdoches, they're being paid for as they go up. God did that. Those two buildings are a million dollars. The property and the other stuff was another half a million dollars. I don't have any money. My wife's got it all. She won't give it to me. <laughs> we just have to trust the Lord, but we trust the Lord, and he's doing it. And it's amazing. It's, you know, I, I tell people all the time, say, I don't believe in miracles. I say, you're standing in one. This is a miracle. There is really no reason, logically, why this ministry should exist. Martin and I, we bump heads all the time trying to figure out how to keep this thing going. And just about everything we figure out, God does something different anyway. Because he knows what he's doing. 
Martin and I like to think we're smart, but we're not. <laughs> of course, Martin's sitting over there saying, speak for yourself. <laughs> Folks, you've got to make a choice to believe. You don't believe in miracles. You don't believe in angels. You believe in the gospel message that Jesus wants you to get into his heaven that you don't deserve to go to. None of us in here deserve to go to heaven. But I'm going. Whether you like it or not, I'm going. Not because I deserve it, but because I trust Jesus. You know, folks, I'm going to tell you something. When God said he would save you if you would trust him and believe in him, if he didn't save you, he would have told a lie. And if he told a lie, he would cease to be God. He cannot lie. So I'm going to heaven based on what? God's word. That's all. Now let me end with this. Thomas, they call him Doubting Thomas, but all the disciples were doubters. He wasn't there the first time Jesus showed up after the resurrection. And the boys got him and said, Thomas, Jesus came. He was here. I will not believe it unless I see it for myself. That's what he said. Unless I can see the prints in his hands and the scar in his side, I will not believe it. Well, the next week, Jesus showed up. The doors are locked, the windows are locked, the shades are pulled. They were a scared bunch of black Baptist preachers, I guess. For, I say that because there's so many Christians in town and you don't see any of them out there trying to tell anybody about Jesus. And uh, Thomas said, I won't believe. Jesus shows up and says, Yo, Tommy! That's the way they talked back then, in case you didn't know. <laughs> he said, come here. Thomas comes over. He says, look at my hands. Look where the nails went through. Look, look at my side. Feel that, where the spear went in. Don't be a doubter. Believe. Make a choice. Believe. And Thomas, of course, made that pronouncement that's so famous. He fell on his face in front of Jesus, and he said, my Lord and my God. He recognized finally who Jesus was. And Jesus said these words, which are so astounding. He said, Thomas, you believe because you see. Blessed are those that believe without seeing. And I've had to learn over the years, especially after we matured a little bit, and the Lord and the miracles stopped because we weren't babies anymore. And that's what gets miracles, babies. Somebody's always doing something for them. It's like the little kids here. But they're always doing something for them. But there comes a day when they've got to grow up and do for themselves. Let the Lord work through you. And when that day came, I found out I don't have to see anything to believe. I didn't need anything to see to believe in the first place, but I didn't know it. But now I know it. And so now I will believe no matter what happens. Like Job said, when God was almost killing him, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And that's the kind of trust you're supposed to have. Father, we thank you for loving us, and we do thank you for each one in this room. And we hope that they're listening, not just with their ears, but with their heart. Because you judge the heart. We need to see sin for what it is. And I know there are times when all of us mess up. We sin in different ways. But at least we need to be honest about it, like King David was. When he was confronted with his sin, he said, yes, I'm the man. And we need to be honest. And we need to trust you to get us into heaven, not because we're good people, but because we're letting Jesus do the driving. We're just riding. We're the passengers. So we thank you. We thank you that there was that day when God stepped out of heaven and clothed divinity with humanity and paid the penalty for our sin and rose from the dead. And it saddens us to think of all the religions around this world, billions upon billions of people that are very religious that are going to end up in hell because they won't do the one thing they're told to do, to trust Jesus. We thank you for our Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.